Good morning and good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted that you were welcoming and joining us today uh, on this incredibly important topic uh, to discuss environmental crime uh, and what we title a law enforcement and global AML priority that impacts the sustainability agenda. Uh, before we go on with the agenda of today and before we introduce the speakers of today, uh, let me first uh, reflect on a video sent us by Interpol uh, really to set the scene uh, on this incredibly important topic. So if I could ask our team to uh, start that video and, uh, and then we'll proceed. That sets, this, this sets the scene uh, of today's uh, agenda and today's topic. Uh, and before we go on uh, with the subject, just a few house, house items that we'd like to go through. The first uh, is that this is going to be recorded. It'll be shared uh, globally to all of those registered. Uh, a few other housekeeping items. Um, please do share your questions with us as we proceed. We'll try to answer them. Uh, as they come in. Uh, we'll also be conducting a survey at the end of this uh, webinar uh, to get your feedback in terms of if the content was what you expected and if, if there's something else that we can certainly do, consider for the future. Uh, we'll also be doing a polling um, later on in the presentation and that all the materials and all the references uh, to what we're going to be discussing today will be made available to you uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the session. So just to set the stage a bit before I introduce our speakers. This week and, and uh, last week, uh, we have COP26, which is really focused the world attention on biodiversity and the impact of climate change. Uh, we ourselves, uh, as a company, have really uh, tried to uh, draw attention to this issue on what we call green crime, uh, which is really the intersection between environmental crime uh, human trafficking, illegal logging, and many other activities uh, that really have uh, gone unnoticed in terms of the political and policy priorities uh, for, the, for the last several years. Uh, and we've also been calling attention to, in, in fact, uh, that one of the key pillars of the sustainability agenda, which is really to try to leverage the car carbon offsetting market as a vehicle to encourage not only companies, but also governments uh, really to find uh, the carbon emissions uh, globally. It turns out, according to Interpol, that the carbon market is fraught with fraud, securities fraud, uh, and also lack of uh, intelligence or pricing dis price discovery mechanisms. So this is another context uh, in which we really look at environmental crime from a, not just from a sustainability perspective, but from a law enforcement perspective. So the convergence between the financial crime agenda and the sustainability agenda uh, is just beginning. Uh, and so we thought it was a good time really to bring together some of the you know, leading thinkers uh, on this issue. And so we're delighted uh, to welcome Rora Kukoran, who joins us from Interpol, uh, who really leads a, a number of these issues uh, from a law enforcement and FIU perspective. And he'll share with you uh, why Interpol thinks this is such an important topic We'll also be joined by Holly, uh, our very own from Refinitiv. Uh, we'll also talk about what we're doing as a company uh, in not just building uh, partnerships and relationships and, and trying to foster a global cooperation, but what we're doing on the data side and the technology that we invested in uh, to ensure that companies and organizations have the best tools at their disposal. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to open it up to Rory, who will have his opening remarks for about 15 to 20 minutes. 
uh, then I'll have a, a few uh, thoughts in terms of what we're doing as a company to try to foster more collaboration in this area. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Holly at the end, who will then talk about some of the things and tools and, and assets that we've been investing in uh, to make sure that we're at the forefront uh, of enabling companies to combat environmental crime uh, for the future. And then hopefully we'll have as much time as we can, hopefully 15 minutes or so, uh, for questions and answers. So without further ado, Rory, please, the floor is yours and very much welcome to this unprecedented uh, webinar where we have 2,400 registrations, uh, which certainly is an indication of the interest uh, on this topic, uh, but please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Che, and uh, welcome to everybody, the participants, and, and incredible numbers, and it's really uh, encouraging to see that type of interest uh, in this, one of our first uh, webinars we, we have uh, arranged with Refinitiv. Just by way of introduction, Uh, so I'll just move on to the next slide. By way of introduction, my name is Rory Corcoran. I'm a police officer from Ireland, and I hold the position of Assistant Director for Interpol's Illicit Markets Subdirectorate. It gives me great pleasure to address you today at this important event organized by Refinitiv. As for Interpol, we see this as a great opportunity to highlight the value of joint cooperation between the public and private sectors in the relentless fight against environmental crime. Environmental crime is an area that remains misunderstood, almost unrecognized by many governments and law enforcement agencies alike. This is why events like this are for us of utmost importance to highlight how environmental crime and how the organized criminal networks behind it are threatening our economies, our stability, and in the long run, our survival. We are talking about a crime area that accounts to approximately $258 billion annually that facilitates trafficking in people, weapons and drugs, as well as funding terrorism and armed violence. And that represents a clear obstacle for countries in addressing climate change and global warming. Here, in my opinion, we must all consider the relationship between organised crime and climate change and the need to develop our joint responses. Today, I will present to you Interpol's response to environmental crime and why this remains a priority for our organisation. So for those of you who don't know, Interpol is an organization made up of 194 member countries. Within each of those countries, we have a national central bureau. We have regional bureaus dotted around the world in most continents. We have a presence in the UN, the European Commission, and the African nation as well. We're an organization mandated to handle police data on behalf of our membership, and with that data, we provide operational support and a tactical response to a number of crime areas. So the reason I wanted to speak about data is I know that we have a lot of private sector people here today. And for what I would call the unconventional crimes, such as environmental crimes, a lot of the answers to this criminality lies within the private sector. And this is why police and private sector agencies working together is vital to tackle all forms of organized crime. So as we know, criminals don't respect borders, and this is why Interpol facilitate the exchange of data across borders to police agencies in order for them to take action in a timely manner. So just to give you an understanding of the type of data we deal with on a daily basis, uh, we have a number of databases from firearms, nominal data, forensic data, motor vehicles, foreign terrorist fighters, and one in particular, our travel and official documents database, which is known as our SLT database, which contains over 100 million records of stolen and lost travel documents. For those of you in the, in the financial sector, we're in the process of rolling that data out to the financial sector in the coming months, and where private sector can use that as part of their, their know their customer processes and due diligence processes to ensure that criminals are not opening bank accounts using these type of documents. So 18 databases, 113 million police records alone, 9 million searches per day are, are conducted on our databases with a response time of 0.5 of a second. And we have a command and coordination center that follows the sun between Leon, Singapore, and Buenos Aires, where we actually provide that operational response to law enforcement agencies 24-7, 365, and around the clock. 
So now I'm going to talk about Interpol's illicit market subdirectorate. For those of you who are not aware, Interpol have three directorates. So we're talking about organized crime, cyber crime, and counterterrorism. Our illicit market subdirectorate sits within our organized crime directorate, and I have responsibility for this. So within that subdirectorate, we have our environmental security program. So why should we focus on environmental crime? Why is it important to us? It is now a global security issue. This type of organized crime is funding terrorism and other forms of organized crime, such as drug trafficking. And also, when we talk about the crime area itself, it is raping our natural resources. And people are motivated by money. And this is a serious global security issue. It is characterized by transnational trafficking and criminal supply chains with a low risk and high reward. It makes it extremely attractive to organized crime groups. So let's talk about the supply chain itself. Along that supply chain, we have a number of corrupt and criminal actors who facilitate this type of criminality. This includes facilitation of other crimes such as fraud, human trafficking, money laundering and corruption. And I think the money laundering aspect is very important here because when we see the amount of money generated from environmental crime, that money has to enter the legitimate system at some stage. So for those of you from the financial sector, it is really important that we are all working together to identify and have these risk indicators uh, available to us that we know where this criminality is happening. As we know with every organized crime transaction, there is usually a money transaction that accompanies that. And this is the type of information that we need to marry up together to try and identify the business model of this type of criminality. So what does Interpol do? What is our response? We bring together 194 countries and relevant stakeholders to tackle the issue. We identify and target international crime syndicates who exploit our national resources. And we support law enforcement to disrupt and dismantle criminal networks. And I'll give you examples of how we do that later on in this presentation. So within our environmental security program, we have five dedicated crime teams. Each one of those crime teams is headed up by a law enforcement officer who is seconded from one of our 90, 194 countries. So we have categorized these as our, our five priority crime areas. So we talk about fishery crimes related to crimes in the entire fishery sector from harvest to processing, and this includes food fraud at customer level. That in itself, and a, a generic term, but really, when we're talking about fisheries crime, we're talking about fraud. We're talking about human trafficking. We're talking about forced labor. We're talking about drug trafficking. We're talking about overfishing that is affecting marine life and ecosystems. We move on to forestry crime, one of the most lucrative crime areas when we talk about environmental crime. This is the one where we connect to deforestation in the Amazon region, which is very relevant at the moment. We talk about the illicit timber trade, criminal activities that destroy biodiversity and threaten the livelihood of those reliant on forest resources. We talk about biodiversity. We talk about the displacement of biodiversity and also the connection to zoonotic diseases. Illegal mining. This is a very interesting crime area that we've recently taken on. It refers to illegal extraction and trade of minerals, including the illegal use of toxic chemicals such as cyanide and mercury as precursors in mining activities. Now we, we have recognized the involvement of drug cartels from Latin America. We have rebel groups and terrorists involved in this type of activity on the continent of Africa. We have human rights abuse. We have huge plantations of illegal mining in these regions and that are not accessible to law enforcement because they're placed very much um, in forest regions that are hard to ac access. Pollution crime refers to various criminal activities such as waste crime, marine pollution crime, illicit trafficking in chemicals, carbon trading crime, and illegal mining. For those of you who are aware of the Italian mafia and the Andragheta, uh, Cosa Nostra, this is a favorite of theirs, have been involved in this type of waste trafficking for a long time. Now we see the involvement of, as we say, traditional organized crime groups getting involved in this because it's hugely lucrative. We look at during the pandemic situation, we generated a lot more waste. This waste has to be disposed of, and this creates opportunities for organized crime. And then finally, wildlife crime. 
refers to criminal activities involved in exploiting wildlife across the globe, threatening protected wildlife species, affecting vulnerable communities, undermining national economies while jeopardizing food security and global health. I don't think I need to speak much about wildlife crime. I think it's well documented. But as we know, our animals and biodiversity are being slaughtered for people who w wish to address a demand coming from different continents in the world for, for commodities such as ivory and rhino horn. So I have to mention crime convergence and particularly the area of financial crime. I've mentioned armed conflict, terrorism, cyber crime. We have issued a guidelines last year when we've seen that a lot of the cyber or a lot of wildlife crime in particular went cyber during the pandemic. And we had to obviously equip uh, and train law enforcement agencies to tackle this and address it. Human trafficking, I've mentioned, is part of fisheries crime, arms and drug trafficking and corruption plays a huge part in environmental crimes. Because anywhere where we see this amount of money being generated, it obviously fuels corruption. But if the financial crime element of this is something that really needs to be addressed. Because as I say, this amount of money needs to be laundered. It needs to be hidden. They have professionalized this side of criminality, as we know. Professional money launders are now setting up shell companies and shelf companies to facilitate this type of trade-based money laundering to ensure that it remains undetected. And anywhere where we have the legitimate and the illegitimate mixing together, it makes it very difficult for law enforcement to detect it. So this is a slide where I just wanted to give you an understanding and idea of how lucrative these crime areas are. So we see illegal logging now is number three after drug trafficking and counterfeiting. In comparative terms, when we look at the sentences handed down for drug trafficking and for illegal logging, well then... Uh, I mean, it speaks for itself. We have people that are, are, are for a kilo of, of cocaine, will be locked in jail for five to 10 years, where if you're caught with timber or involved in, in some type of a consortium that's uh, trading in illegal timber, you're usually uh, sanctioned with a fine. This is just to give you an idea. When we talk about a kilo of cocaine, we talk about a kilo of gold and a kilo of rhino horn. This was brought very much close to where uh, I originate from in Ireland, where I've seen that Irish criminals recently were arrested in France as part of an international syndicate trading in rhino horn. I was very happy to see that the French authorities handed out uh, very lengthy sentences to these individuals, and we have issued red notices for those people now and are actively pursuing their whereabouts. So when we look about cutting a horn 10 minutes, transfer from South Africa to Zimbabwe to Mozambique 12 hours, air transfer from Mozambique to Vietnam, 36 hours, processed and distributed to an Asian market, a further 24 hours, and in 48 hours, it's sold in a Vietnamese market. And as we know, the trail of destruction that this leaves behind where they're slaughtering rhinos. And I mean, a lot of people uh, look at the, the actual slaughtering process, um, but I mean, you're looking at countries that have no alternative, uh, that have no way of funding their lifestyle, and this is all they know, and it's not frowned upon within those regions. And this is why awareness is key, that we have to create more awareness. Uh, for the, These are the crimes that are fueling then the additional crimes and the crime convergence of money laundering, because there's huge money being made from this type of criminality. So what Interpol can do and policing capabilities? I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to keep this very brief. We coordinate operations, and I'll give you examples of that. Operational deployments, we deploy to any of our 194 countries around the world to provide that type of expertise and mentoring to law enforcement agencies to ensure that they're aware of the problem and they're able to tackle it. Training, we've trained thousands of police officers all around the world in the area of environmental crime. We're now in the process of training FIUs and financial intelligence units and working very close with FATF and the Egmont Group. Environmental crime working groups, we established task forces and working groups on a national and regional basis, bringing together the likes of customs, enforcement agencies, environmental protection agencies to work very closely together to understand the threat, and we support them then to address it. Criminal intelligence analysis, we focus very much on collection of data from a number of sources, not just from police. Uh, with that data, we try to understand the business model of the criminals involved in this type of criminality. And then what we do is we engage with the countries to try and tackle it, identify these people, and obviously dismantle them as well. Regional and investigative case meetings. This is something we do on a regional level after global operations, 
where we identify a particular organized crime group or a trafficking route, and we will home in on that to target those individuals and try and dismantle that network. And multi-agency collaboration, this is one great example of it, but I mean, it's all about agency collaboration. Nobody can tackle the issue of environmental crime alone. It's an enforcement issue, but there's a lot of other stakeholders involved and could help. So what Interpol is doing, global operations, as I said, these global operations are a way of, of collecting information, shining a light on this crime area for a number of weeks. Um, and with that information, then it's very important that although we arrest people, we disrupt them at a very probably low level. When we look at some of the uh, seizures we get, for me, seizures have, a, have a, a limited capability when we're talking about disruption because there, there is still a demand for that commodity. So it drives up the price of the commodity. Those people still have to go back and slaughter the same amount of animals or cut down the same amount of forest because on the other side of that transaction, there's somebody who, who demands that, that uh, commodity. So we're talking about 30 days at sea. Uh, it's around marine pollution since 2018, Operation Thunder, we're talking about wildlife trafficking and a forestry crime. So just to give you an idea, last year, Operation Thunder 2020, we arrested 699 offenders. And I just want to refer to that in a later slide, in my final slide. Uh, but there you can see the volume of commodities that we seize over a particular length of time. And again, we're just shining a light on two weeks or three or four weeks but what happens for the rest of those 11 months of that year, these people in some countries and regions are acting with impunity. 30 days at sea last year, you can see the rise in the, in the amount of participating countries we have involved. And this is great for us to see that these type of crimes are getting traction in those countries. But the amount of inspections we carried out, 33,500 inspections, we conducted a number of arrests. We also are following up on some of those investigations and supporting our member countries. So this is the extent of, of the issue. This is how we respond to the issue by bringing these countries together over a period of time to jointly tackle the problem. Forestry crime, this is just important for me because we, that video at the start showed our 10 year anniversary, which was last year of the environmental security program but it shows what we have done in those 10 years. Over 900 arrests, 1.2 million cubic meters of timber seized, which is the equivalent of 37,000 truckloads. So again, it's still only scratching the surface when we look at this problem. It's only a period of time that we have decided to look there where these things are happening. An awful lot more needs to be done. So finally, uh, this is my last slide. When I refer to people being arrested as part of these global operations, a lot of these times these people are bailed or they're released for further charges and they go back into the communities um, and remain undetected for, for a considerable amount of time. Over the past year, what we have done is we've conducted an assessment of all Interpol red notices of people wanted for environmental crimes. And to our shock, we've realized that there's been a 600% increase in the amount of red notices issued for persons involved in crimes related to the environment. We are now engaged with both the public and private sectors, which is our membership and other private sector entities, including the financial sector, to try and profile these people, identify their whereabouts and arrest them. I can't obviously give you uh, intimate details of how this is going to progress, um, but this is a very important initiative for us because we're using data from a number of sources to try and locate these people. The, the notice you will see there in the right-hand corner is an initiative we did last year uh, where we actually highlighted some of these people that were wanted for environmental crimes. We got a great response from the public and other agencies, and we managed to track down and arrest some of these people. So thank you from me. Uh, on, on a final note, I just want to say, while I am speaking to you, our countries are reunited in Glasgow, discussing actions to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. While I'm speaking to you, Interpol's member countries are also united worldwide, participating in three Interpol intelligence-led global operations in the area of forestry, fisheries, and wildlife crime. We're bringing together 200 countries in the fight against environmental crime. We have been pioneering in recognizing environmental crime as a priority for Interpol. We are committed to lead this fight against criminal and corrupt elements who are destroying our natural resources for personal gain, 
while having a complete disregard for the future of our planet. It is Interpol's role to tackle the criminality that is fueling this global crisis, but we cannot do it alone. Collectively, collectively we must be as committed and organized as the people who are perpetrating these crimes. It takes a network to defeat a network. Thank you very much, Shay. That's fantastic, Rory, and thank you for such a, a comprehensive overview of what Interpol are doing. And there's so many elements there that resonate so much with what we've discussed previously and certainly what we're doing uh, as a company. And, and I re reflect on your statement that this is a crisis. Uh, we did conduct a poll, in fact, uh, prior to the um, prior to the events uh, on whether or not, in fact, uh, you know, organizations, people think that environmental crime is a growing transnational, transnational threat. Uh, and, and as you can see, as plain as day, uh, this issue is certainly at the forefront of many organizations. So from what we're, you know, what we're trying to tackle uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we raise awareness, that we promote collaboration, as you, as you spoke of, uh, Rory, and, and, and simply we're committed to that as a company. We have not been shy about forming collaborations and, and partnerships or organizations uh, so, and, and governments for that matter, such as the South African Anti-Money Laundering Integrated Task Force, uh, which is focusing on not just wildlife trafficking, but human trafficking, uh, working with NGOs out there who are doing incredible work, including the Sentry, uh, which is founded by George Clooney, um, or the Freedom Seal, uh, founded by Ronnie Hong, a former uh, child slave and now the CEO uh, and an UN advisor uh, on this topic. So, so we are certainly here and committed and, and look forward to, to working with you uh, and Interpol and other FIUs uh, on this incredible topic. So we've had a number of questions have come in, Rory. Uh, I will keep them in my pocket for the moment. Uh, I'll make sure to turn back to you on a number of questions about what Interpol are doing on specific areas. Uh, but before I do that, let me now introduce uh, Holly, uh, who's one of our uh, managers uh, within the World Check and Refinitiv uh, uh, franchise, uh, and get your thoughts uh, on not only what Rory had talked about, what Interpol are, are, are doing, but what we are doing ourselves. Uh, it's not just we're just trying to raise awareness, but we're actually really trying to invest in the capability and assets uh, that certainly we we, we have. So. Uh, Holly, let me turn it over to you uh, to discuss uh, some of the things that we're doing. Great. Thank you, Che. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. So as Che said, I'll take a few minutes to talk to you about what we and the World Check team at Refinitiv are doing to help our customers detect financial crime risk that can give um, rise to reputational and financial um, risk if a uh, individual or entity is involved with any alleged criminal activity. Now, we know that good decisions start with good data. Uh, so we know it's important to provide access to quality adverse media content uh, to be able to identify those potential risks and help our customers make informed decisions during their customer onboarding, their ongoing screening, and their third-party due diligence process. And this, in turn, will give them confidence that they are complying with the applicable laws and regulations around that due diligence process. So what specifically are we doing in the area of adverse media screening? Well, we are releasing a new feature called Special Interest Categories, or SICs. And this is a taxonomy of 67 civil and criminal predicate offenses to money laundering. And they'll point to the reason for the individuals or the entity's inclusion uh, in the World Check database. It will help our customers uh, with their adverse media screening by making it easy for them to focus on the applicable areas of risk um, that, are, that are applicable to their screening needs. So what does this special interest category feature look like in practice? Well, first, the World Check record will be clearly labeled with all of the relevant SICs. Uh, 
and we'll be labeling both the pre and the post conviction records. So just to give you an example, if I were alleged to be involved with environmental crime, you would see uh, the world check record in the database for Holly Palesco would have the special interest category of environmental crime as the label. And um, if later down the road I was actually convicted of that crime, uh, it would become a post-conviction record. And in our reports section of the record, you would see the full details of the event as provided to us in our reputable media sources, our government, and other official sources. So, for example, in the reports section, you would see the date of action, any event details, fine amounts, sentencing amounts, uh, indications such as that. Now, within the 67 special interest categories, two of them fall under the environmental crime or the green crime umbrella. The first being environmental crime, uh, which, is, which are the areas that Rory just highlighted, and you can see they align, our definition aligns with what Rory just described to you. Things like pollution, illegal, illegal dumping, uh, smuggling of ozone substances, illegal logging, and illegal fishing. And then our second SIC category is wildlife crime. And again, this lines up with what Rory just uh, defined for you, the intentional killing or injuring of endangered species, illegal poaching, uh, trafficking of endangered species or parts. Now, currently in the uh, World Check database, we're estimating that we'll have about 2.8 million records uh, that will be tagged with one or more of these special interest categories. Um, and we have upwards of about 40,000 that will be tagged with environmental crime and or wildlife crime. Uh, so just to paint a, a little bit of a clearer picture, if I were convicted of wildlife crime, let's say, uh, my record in the World Check database would have the special interest category of wildlife crime as its label. And in the report section, you might see uh, something like in January of 2021, Holly Palesco was sentenced to six years imprisonment and fined 1,000 euros for the possession of leopard skins and dealing in materials of endangered species. Um, now, rest assured, I, I have no plans to be engaged in wildlife crime in the future, but what I really wanted to do is just paint a picture to show you of uh, what we in WorldCheck are doing to help our customers to really detect that financial crime in an easy way through the adverse media screening process and focus in on any area of risk that's applicable to them, including environmental crime or wildlife crime. So that was really all I had to talk about, Rory, with the adverse media screening. I'm happy to turn it back over to you or answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, and uh, before we, uh, before I look at some of the uh, opposition, some of the questions that have come through, and, and again, I do encourage you to, to send them through to us. We have quite a bit, and I'll try to get to them as as quickly as I can. Uh, beyond beyond um, establishing partnerships and, of course, investing in our data, uh, we are also uh, doing more analysis and using our research process to publish uh, some use cases uh, as well. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to look at those. They're all publicly available, which clearly shows the international dimension uh, of, this, of this issue uh, and also shows the impact, really, of, uh, of particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that it has uh, on their env environmental ecosystem. So, so I you know, ho hope that you that you can look at that as, a, as an interesting report. And we'll be doing more of that type of research uh, as well. Last thing, also, we've talked about environmental crime, wildlife trafficking, how it connects to many other forms of, of criminal activity like human trafficking. The other thing that we're also going to pay much more attention to as a company and working together with Interpol and, and many others is really understanding uh, the impact of green crime, environmental crime that it has in the capital markets or the commodities market. Uh, and, and here I'm referring specifically to the carbon offset trading market, uh, which is one of the fastest, the fastest growing commodities uh, market in, in the world estimated to be about 200 billion euros uh, and growing by 23% just in the last year alone. And because the carbon offset market is such a pivotal feature of the sustainability agenda, 
you know, there needs to be more attention to make sure that this market, the integrity is protected, the market integrity is protected, uh, and, and it doesn't cause, you know, undue issues uh, and potential financial crime vulnerabilities like securities fraud. Uh, or, other, or other aspects. So uh, stay tuned on that particular topic that we'll, we'll be doing more work uh, on that in particular. But uh, maybe I can turn to, to you, uh, Rory, uh, in terms of some of the questions I've, that have come in here, uh, and particularly around, um, there's a question about, um, while the, the numbers are high, um, you know, how much actually sentencing uh, is, currently, is currently being um, um, you know, being divvied out to criminal activities. You, you mentioned that the, you know, comparing it to money laundering or other traditional forms of financial crime is is a much bigger part rather than comparing it to individuals who are who are caught with illegal logging or or whether transportation of other activities as well. So, how do you see the incentives piece uh, really being commensurate with the with the activity itself? Thank you, Che. And, and this is why, obviously, uh, it's very attractive to criminals, because it's high reward and, and the risk is not there. It's like the old days of going back uh, when cigarette smuggling was a hugely lucrative area and there was no sanctions. Now it's become more uh, categorized as, as organized crime. But yeah, this is a constant battle for us. Uh, on a national level, we can't lobby governments to change legislation. We can produce the facts to them. We can present them with the issues. We can arrest and assist in the arrest of people to highlight the issue. But really, it's up to governments themselves and decision makers and lawmakers in those countries to increase the sanctions based on... You're talking about proportionality now. We're looking at the impact of these crimes on, on not just the planet, but on criminality itself. It is a global security issue it's funding organized crime, it's funding terrorism. So our response needs to be in some way proportionate to the crimes that are being committed. But Interpol don't really get involved, as I say, in, in that area, uh, other than to highlight the problem. No, that, 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 uh, that, that certainly makes sense, and certainly our reflection as well, uh, that the you know, legislative process, which is another question here, in fact, uh, is, does, is not keeping up uh, with the rea reality of making sure that there's, uh, the enforcement mechanisms are there and the legal framework is, in fact, there to, to, um, you know, to, to, to take some of these individuals and prosecute these individuals. Uh, and, in fact, according to okay. our research, Rory, that we conducted last year when we asked companies um, you know, if they're aware that their third parties are involved somehow in environmental damaging activities, uh, Sixty-five percent said yes. Uh, so, so many companies are aware that this is going on. Uh, they just, you know, the, the incentive the regime uh, is just not is just not there. Um, but but I could just say, to... Jay, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, uh, th this is why I think it's important to focus on the financial element of, of this type of criminality, um, and and really use money laundering legislation once we detect this type of money in the financial system, that it's important that that information gets reported to financial intelligence units and then gets actioned or disseminated to law enforcement. What we have done in the last number of years is we're encouraging financial intelligence units to seek access to Interpol's databases. We have done that, but it's something that needs to be rolled out on a global level where these STRs or SARs can be compared against existing police data uh, and they can prioritise some of them based on maybe some of the actors involved uh, or, or whatever the extent of the criminality. But I think that's really important to note that the, the money laundering side of this is really important. Thank you, Rory. And a question for you, Holly, that we've received here. So does uh, WorldCheck, uh, I'm reading directly here, does WorldCheck today return individuals associated with green crime? How, how I take that is, does WorldCheck you know, provide a tag? Uh, if you will, with individuals associated with environmental and wildlife crime today? Sure. Thank, thank you for that question. We are in the process of tagging those 2.8 million records with the 67 different SIC categories. 
Uh, I believe we've tagged eight of the 67 categories and we're working out our timeline for doing the remaining, uh, which will be finished next year. I believe uh, environmental crime and wildlife crime have already been tagged and delivered in the product. And that's how I can say uh, there's just north of 40,000 records that are tagged with either environmental and or wildlife crime. Thanks, Solid. And another question, uh, I'm not sure if, if uh, anyone has a definitive answer on this, but I did, did want to uh, pose it if anyone has a response to it. Uh, how often do financial institutions exit relationships with first media screening list? Um, and, you know, I, I guess it's an open, open question for if anyone wanted to get to that. But, you know, how often do organizations exit or terminate relationships if, uh, if in fact, their counterparties or Organizations that do business with are, are found in an adverse media list. Um, for, from my perspective, I can't really comment yeah. on, on the, the private sector. Maybe Holly would like to comment on it. Too. Yeah, I, you cut out a little bit during the question. I think you, you asked, um, Jay was asked how often companies will terminate the relationship, the financial relationship, That's if right. financial crime is detected. If environmental crime or green crime, as we call it, is, is yeah. actually caught. No, I, I don't really have an answer to that question either. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't no. can't provide yeah. any, any yeah, details. No, I don't know if you have an idea, Che. <laughs> it's completely understandable. Yeah. Um, and then the other piece, uh, I guess, which is really important regarding how much media coverage is actually how reliable is uh, do we find the media coverage related to environmental crime and the quality of that reporting and, and i don't know if Hall, if you have a, a view on that in terms of the information that we receive which clearly goes through a very yes. stringent inclusion criteria yes. what's your perspective in terms of uh, you know the quality of reporting absolutely uh we have a very uh, detailed and lengthy historical process of curating our uh, both media sources and other government and official sources. Regarding media, we will only use uh, reputable media sources. And I can tell you to date, our curated list of reputable media sources numbers in the thousands. And we always try, if it's if it's an adverse media record with no other type of risk identified other than the adverse media, we always use those reputable sources from our curated list. And we always try to corroborate it. We never try to give just one source. We always try to have at least two sources from our reputable media source list on each record. Thank you. Um, and. Uh... Rory, a question for you, maybe, um, in terms of some of the work that Interpol has been doing. There's a question here about uh, red flags um, and if there are any advice that you could give or any red flag indications that you've seen uh, associated with environmental crime, uh, given your work uh, with Interpol and, and your interaction on this issue. Yeah, Shay, to us, it's really about the supply chain and it's about people. The, the business model of organized crime is people motivated by money, but they have to get one commodity from one region of the world to, to the next. Uh, they'll try and conceal it using free trade zones in different areas as well to conceal their activity. But this is why we work with the customs agencies as well, exchange information. But really, it's about threat actors uh, to identify the people behind it is hugely important. Um, and this can be done from a number of ways. And you mentioned open source data as well. Um, a lot of these things are being sold on social media, been advertised and held up as trophies on social media. We can use different types of technology uh, to identify these people as well, whether it's facial recognition or other types of AI technology. But yeah, we're all the time trying to keep up the speed uh, in that area to ensure that whatever data uh, we have is used uh, as best we can to try and identify these people and obviously share it then with people who can help us to to more to work on a more risk-based approach as opposed to we can't police the world unfortunately so we have to home in on certain people in certain areas where we know this activity is happening 
Thank you, Rory. And uh, a question for you, Holly. How many different categories uh, are included in the special interest category of functionality? There's 67 in total, and they are all of those uh, civil and criminal predicate offenses to money laundering. So they do line up with the FATF principles. Yeah. And then um, another question here. Is there sufficient legislation within the EU or the UK to be able to prosecute the individuals and corporates that are involved in the environmental crime? My own perspective, uh, Rory, um, is that it's, it's, it's not really... Uh, well defined enough. There isn't enough legislative uh, processes currently um, uh, there on the books, and I think there's some more work need, needing to be done. And I and I note the incredible work by by United for Wildlife, for instance, who are involved um, uh, in in making sure that you know wildlife trafficking, environmental crime issues are top of mind, with certainly within the UK government, but also globally. Uh, but, you know, how do you reflect on that? And I know that Interpol doesn't get involved in the, the, the policy debate from that perspective, but what are your views uh, in terms of the existing legislative framework and where, whether it supports Interpol's focus on this or whether, you know, more needs to be done? Yeah, a, a good question. And when you mentioned the UK and the EU itself, uh, we are, of course, we work for Interpol's core business, which is tackling criminality. But we also have a number of, of uh, projects around the world that are funded by external donors. Uh, I'm glad to say the EU is one of those donors and the UK is an additional donor. So uh, they give us the resources to tackle these crimes, uh, knowing that possibly uh, the final destination of these commodities are developed countries, including the EU. So we're trying to uh, maybe... Uh, I'm trying to use the right terminology, but uh, I'm being very sensitive. I can't mention regions or countries, but you know that I'm talking where they're coming from. So we try to yeah. work within those other regions around the world to try and contract that. Um, but when we talk, say, about legislation, there is a lot more to be done. I know the EU are working on a definition for environmental crime at the moment. So there are, you know, it, it, it is very prominent at the moment, the, the whole issue of climate change, global warming, environmental crime. So we have a window of opportunity now to get these things right uh, and to create the right mechanisms, and that includes legal mechanisms to tackle it. And then um, uh, maybe a last question for, for both of you, Rory and Holly, and then we'll conduct a poll, uh, and then uh, I'll invite you for your, for your final thoughts on that poll uh, and your, your concluding remarks in general. Uh, but the question I'd like to leave off with here is, uh, at the end of the day, um, do you anticipate there being more aggressive prosecution against criminals engaged in environmental crime in the future? Uh, so, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Rory. I know that Interpol Paul is spending quite a bit of activity and focus on this, but do you expect more prosecution uh, in the future? Yeah, I, I referenced it in my last uh, in my last slide. Uh, we're taking a particular uh, course of action in relation to people behind this threat um, in the coming months. Um, and I hope that you will see it. It'll obviously be uh, something prominent in the media when we do it. We're, we're, we're focusing on a particular region in the world. Uh, a number of people that are behind this type of criminality. Uh, so we do hope for a lot of more activity, a lot more arrests. And, and creating that uh, deterrent uh, to people who may have that decision to make, will I get involved in environmental crime? Is it low risk? Is it high reward? We just want to heighten that risk. Yeah. I'm not sure, Paul, if you had a, a view on that. And then I, I, I w there's actually another question that I've been asked a number of times here, so I will make sure that to, to, to leave that off. But, Holly, any, any reflections on, on how you're seeing our customers responding to this issue? Yeah, we've had quite a bit of interest in this, uh, the adverse media structure, structuring via the special interest categories. Absolutely. We get asked, you know, almost weekly about um, not only when we have it, what are the specific timelines. We've um, asked for the prioritized list uh, specifically of which SICs will be tackling when. So absolutely. I agree with everything Rory just said, you know, awareness is key and um, as we continue to do things like use algorithms to structure the data, make it easier for our clients to detect 
the financial crime risk and focus on any area. Um, Rory had spoken a little bit about the crime convergence. Uh, as we label these records with the SIC categories, you'll really be able to see clearly and easily that crime convergence picture if an individual is involved in uh, wildlife crime and human trafficking or narcotics trafficking and environmental crime. All of that will be labeled on the record and will provide the full history, as I said, in our report section so that you can do further remediation and really drill down into the details, including all of the sources from where we got the information. So I think the more that we engage in the public-private partnerships we've been talking about. We just have more information we're able to pull into the world check system uh, and integrate into our records. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Holly. And then um, I, will, I will reflect on this question, which is very much tied to the polling question that we're going to uh, put up in a moment, but maybe reflect on the question as part of the polling results. Let's put it that way. We can do. We can do achieve both. And the question really is around, you know, commenting on, on, on efforts to introduce equal side uh, as part of the International Criminal Court uh, statute. Uh, so, for, for for those of you who may be uh, uh, not aware, there, there is a there is a, a campaign, in fact, to to put equal side alongside genocide and other uh, other the International Criminal Court um, uh, criminal uh, statutes as well. So, so let's reflect on that question in a moment. And then, in fact, uh, that there is a question here about, uh, from a law enforcement perspective, and I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pause this for a few moments to make sure that people have time to reflect on it and to answer, but is there enough enforcement uh, to fight uh, environmental crime? Uh, and this can, the enforcement can be about legal structures. We talked about the, the efforts around putting equal side alongside uh, other criminal um, uh, elements as well, uh, and also law enforcement themselves, and whether you think there's enough focus uh, from the law enforcement community. So I will I will leave it in a few, few minutes, and then what we'll do is we'll look at the polling results, Roy and Holly, and then you will have a few minutes to reflect uh, on those answers uh, and also any concluding uh, remarks uh, that you would like to make. So um, hopefully we can have... Uh, the polling results fairly soon, and uh, let's see where we are. Well, uh, there we have it. Um, the polling results are, are still coming in, uh, or the, the answers are still coming in, so, so uh, please continue to answer if you haven't had the opportunity. But, but clearly, Rory, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty um, clear uh, viewpoint out there in terms of whether there's enough focus, law enforcement focus, uh, on this issue with 78% as, as saying that there isn't enough uh, enforcement. So any any reflections on that? And then, Holly, you know, would love to hear your, your thoughts on this, and then we'll have our concluding remarks. Rory, please, your reflections on yes, this. Yes, Jay, um, I, I, can't, uh, I can't really argue with that figure. Um, because it's it is something we we do encounter, uh, and to to get that type of traction from law enforcement is is the greatest challenge we face. But I'm also very confident in the work we are doing and the environmental security program that we have established over the last ten years. Uh, for us to turn our back on this crime area uh, would leave a huge void, um, and and it, that's not going to happen in any time soon uh, because we are committed to it. Interpol are committed to it, but I think that. You know, we have a framework in place. We need to build on that framework, uh, particularly with the private sector and with the banking sector. I think that's hugely important. Uh, we're fully engaged with, with FATF and Egmont uh, and other groups. You mentioned United for Wildlife. And I think that gives us access to, to other types of data as well to help us um, better tackle this crime area. But it is a priority now for governments, I would hope, following the different uh, conferences and, and events we've had and are ongoing at the moment. I would hope that will trickle down to law enforcement agencies and they'll be adequately resourced and equipped to deal with the problem. But it, it is a global problem. It requires a global response. We're willing to fill that void for the moment, but really we need the support of our member countries to, to effectively tackle it. Thank you, Rory. And then Holly, your, your reflections on this question. Yeah, I, I agree. And 
And we could talk about, uh, is there enough enforcement to fight environmental crime? And hopefully, you know, everything we've been talking about through the partnerships and the work Interpol is doing will help start to turn that tide. And it's not only from a law enforcement perspective, but from the uh, financial crime risk is, uh, perspective, where we're providing our customers uh, all of the tools they need to detect that financial crime risk, uh, and specifically in this case, the environmental crime risk, so that they can also act upon it um, and block any customer onboarding. They're not engaging in, you know, or unknowingly engaging in any any of that activity by allowing the, you know, the terrorists or the money launderers to be able to uh, launder their money through their system. So I think it is a multi-pronged effort and just the fact that we're having this webinar today and the overwhelming response to it is, is hopeful news, I think. Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you so much, Rory. Uh, we have a lot of other questions uh, that have come in. We won't have time for all of them. We will do our best uh, to, to get back to you uh, after, after this uh, webinar. But there's a lot of questions, Holly, about special interest category functionality. You know, what's the, you know, is, it, is it another feature uh, you know, in, in part with the existing offering that we currently have or is it an extension, uh, gotcha. et cetera? There's a lot of questions around how we, how we collect data, where we get it from. Uh, this question's Rory, of course, about, uh, well, there's a comment, a number of comments, that there isn't enough enforcement on existing uh, financial crime uh, uh, topics like money laundering and terrorism mm -hmm. financing. So how can we certainly expect the financial community or the industry overall uh, to, to pivot uh, on, on this issue? Um, uh, there's a lot more questions that have come in that we won't have time for on crypto assets and, and, and all the rest of it. So rest assured, we will collate uh, all these uh, questions, we will we will uh, get back to you to answer them the best that we can with Rory and Holly's support. Uh, all the information that we have mentioned here in terms of surveys, studies that we've done, material from the uh, Interpol, uh, we'll make sure that we have them available. Uh, please do spend a, a moment or two, if you would, uh, to comment. Uh, we'll certainly give us your feedback if this session was helpful. Um, uh, to make sure that we, we, we give you know the, the best um, uh, you know the, the best webinars that we can do on, on, on topics that we certainly consider to be important. Uh, and there is a lot of questions regarding the carbon trading market uh, issue uh, in terms of uh, the, the functioning uh, of that market currently uh, and some of the manipulations that currently uh, has been uh, advised uh, or certainly highlighted by Interpol but also the financial sector as well uh, so we will we will focus on that issue i'm sure in the, in the, in the coming weeks or months so with that let me uh, thank again uh heartful thanks to rory holly all of you for joining us uh it's been you know really interesting on, a, on a, an important topic and certainly the fact that we have uh, 2400 registrations uh is a is an indication that there's this tremendous interest uh, on this topic. Uh, so again, thank you for taking the time. Uh, enjoy uh, your rest of the, your day and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.